Well, we're making our way through, through Luke. This is sermon number 18. Can you imagine that we've gotten so far in Luke? Sermon number 18. Last week was um, Easter, and we talked about the tomb, the empty tomb. And this week, we're going to talk about the road to Emmaus, which happened this very same day in the afternoon after Jesus had, written, has, had risen. As a former newspaper editor and lifelong lover of words, I don't too often run into words that I don't know or have never heard before. English words, anyway. But in my research for this sermon last week, this past week, I ran into a word that I'd never heard before, at least I don't remember ever hearing before. The word is liminal. Of course, like any word I don't know, I looked it up. And I found out that liminal means existing at the limit, or of or pertaining to a limit. Well, this did not help. The only thing that came to mind for me when I read that was, if life gives you a lemon, make lemonade. <laughs> right? So I looked a little further and I found another definition that said, if, oh, wait, no, wait a minute, that said, I can't find it, intermediate between two states, conditions, or region, regions, transitional or indeterminate. Still a little bit confusing, but a little better. So I figured out that liminal, an adjective, means being between two spaces or conditions. So for just a little bit more clarification, I did a Google search and I found a website that's actually called liminal, liminal I can't even say it, liminalspace.org. And it's a website of an organization, I guess, that provides liminal guides to people to help them through their liminal spaces. I thought that was pretty interesting. So this is, a, this is from that website. It says, the word liminal comes from the Latin word limen, meaning threshold, any point or place of entering or beginning. A liminal space is the time between the what was and the next. It is a place of transition, a season of waiting and not knowing. Then it added, liminal space is where all transformation takes place if we learn to wait and let it form us. Now I kind of understood it. And I thought about it. And I realized that in my life I have been in liminal spaces a number of times. Spaces where something has ended and I'm waiting for something else to begin. And I bet you've been in some liminal spaces too. In fact, I know that some people in this church are in liminal spaces right now. And they're not the most comfortable places to be, are they? In our scripture passage this morning, we meet two disciples of Jesus who are also in a liminal space. The passage, Luke 24, 13 to 32, follows immediately after the scene we discussed last week when the women went to Jesus' tomb, found it empty, and were told by angels that Jesus had, been, had risen from the dead. So let's read the first part of that passage this morning. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, 
Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. So let's look at this. First of all, we have two disciples walking along a road away from Jerusalem toward a place called Emmaus. We don't know anything about Emmaus, except that that's where they're going. The passage tells us very little about these disciples. One is named Cleopas, and the other is not named. Most scholars believe that this is another man, another male disciple. But there are some scholars who disagree with that. They think that Cleopas, in this reference, is the same person who John mentions in uh, chapter 19 of his gospel, whose name is Clopas. The same name, but without the E. It's been suggested that Cleopas is the Greek variation of the word Clopas in Hebrew or Aramaic. John wrote that one of the women at the foot of the cross was Mary, wife of Clopas. So those scholars have suggested that if Cleopas and Clopas are the same person, then the person walking with Cleopas may very well be Mary, his wife, and they're going back to Emmaus after the, after the Passover. But we don't know. What we do know is that it was two disciples. And one was named Cleopas. So in any case, these two disciples were dejected, forlorn, crestfallen. The passage says that they stood with their faces downcast. Now this seems really odd to me because they had been told that the women went to the tomb and saw an angel who said that Jesus was no longer there, that he had risen from the dead. And wasn't that exactly what Jesus had said before was going to happen? Just a day or two before it happened, he told the disciples that he was going to die and rise from the dead. So why were they downcast? Well, <clears throat> it appears to me that they didn't believe the women. The last time they had seen Jesus, he had died on the cross, and they couldn't get past that unthinkable event, even though they had heard that he would rise, and even though they had heard that he did. Then there was also their expectations. Like so many others, these disciples had expectations for the Messiah that were not met. In verses 20 and 21, they told Jesus, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. When Jesus died without meeting their expectations for a Messiah, they seemed to have given up on him. He didn't do what they wanted him to do. And so they gave up. Even after giving their lives to him, even after listening to his teachings, we don't know how long they, they were with all the disciples, but at least those last few days when Jesus was talking, about all these things. 
All they could see now was that he was now dead and Israel was still under Roman occupation and oppression. So as a result, they were in this liminal space. They had counted on Jesus being the Messiah that they wanted. He had died. He was not. Everything they had counted on was now gone. What was next? They had no idea. So how does Jesus respond to this? Let's read verses 25 to 27. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now remember, they didn't recognize Jesus yet. And so here was this random person that they didn't know who walked up and he's telling, him, telling them, all of the prophecies from the Old Testament. And we know there's something like 360 of them. And he's going through them and explaining them out as they walk back to Emmaus. Now, we don't know how long these disciples had been, uh, these two people had been disciples. But we know they had been disciples long enough to call the others their companions. So they had developed relationships. And we know they had been, long enough, been disciples long enough to stay with the other disciples during that few days of the Passion. Because they were there when the women went and came back from the tomb. They were there when Peter and the others ran to the tomb. So it seems they had been with Jesus for some time, and no doubt he had heard them say, heard him say more than once that he had to die and rise again. But they still didn't get it. And so what is Jesus' response is, call them foolish for their lack of understanding. But notice what Jesus does next after calling them foolish. He teaches them. He goes back over it all. This is a patient Jesus. This is a determined Jesus. He is perturbed with them. I mean, you can tell. He calls them fools. He's perturbed with these two disciples. But what's more important to him is that they understand. He's going to give them one more chance. Always one more chance. And perhaps that's the very reason, <clears throat> excuse me, that he's on the road to Emmaus, that he appeared before them. He knew they were struggling. He wanted them to understand, just as he wanted the disciples still in Jerusalem to understand, which is why he appeared to them, why he showed Thomas the doubter the holes in his hands, to show that he still lived, even though he was dead. So let's pick up the scripture where we left off with verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Jesus had obviously had a great impact on these two disciples just in this short time that they walked. Now, it was seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We don't know exactly where Jesus met them, presumably early in their walk, but you figure seven miles, this a couple, two, three hours they'd spent together. And in that time, Jesus had, had already such an impact on them that they didn't want their time with him to end. They wanted him to come in and stay with them in this house that they had gone to. We don't know if this was their house and they had gone to Jerusalem for the Passover or whether it was a tavern along the road, we have no idea. Not part of the story, and it's not important to the story. But they didn't want their time to end. 
even though they still didn't know who he was. Now, I've thought about why Jesus didn't want them to know who he was. And I think it might be because if he, they knew who he was, he wouldn't be able to go through all this teaching again. And he had a plan for them. He wanted them to know all this stuff. He wanted it ingrained in their brains. And if he had showed up as himself, they would have been so excited, they wouldn't have been listening to him. They would have been jubilant about him being there. But this gave him two, three hours of one-on-two -on attention, teaching. What teacher wouldn't love that with their students? So as they walked, he taught them all that the, all that the prophets had said about him. And then, when he was done, he finally made himself known to them. Verses 30 to 32 say, When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So Jesus appears and then vanishes. Just to let them know who he was. And then vanishes. I love this passage of scripture about the road to Emmaus. And for a lot of reasons, really. It shows us just how much Jesus loves us. This was within just a few hours of the discovery of the empty, the empty tomb, just hours after Jesus rose from the dead. And you know he had to have had a lot to do. He told Mary, I haven't gone to heaven yet. Don't touch me. He had things to do, and yet he took this span of time, this whole afternoon, on this most important day, the most important day in history, by the way, the day Jesus rose from the grave, and he took the whole afternoon and spent it with two disciples who were forlorn because he had died. The passage also shows how patient Jesus is. We might expect that when he found out that these two still didn't understand what he had taught them, the implications of his death and resurrection, even after he had gone over it again and again, he could have thrown his hands up in the air in exasperation and said, eh, and left them. Well, they're not going to help my cause. They just don't get it. But he didn't. He patiently told them again. And this passage also shows that Jesus has a plan for each of us. We know what his plan was for the disciples. To build a church. To draw people to the truth. To go out there and share the news, the good news of Jesus, the gospel. Well, they couldn't share it if they didn't know it. They couldn't share it if they were forlorn and dejected and thought he had simply died unfulfilled without fulfilling what the Messiah came to do. But he had a plan for them, and it was important to him. And so he spent this afternoon with them. So Jesus found these two disciples in a liminal... liminal <laughs> I love the word. Liminal space. Having lost what meant most to them. Having no idea what would come next. And then Jesus provided for them a purpose and a plan. And gave them back their future. They had lost it when he died. They got it back when he appeared to them. Jesus does the same for us. I know some of you... In this church, some here today, some watching, and some who will watch later, are in liminal spaces right now. Maybe you've lost your job. Your spouse has left you. Maybe someone you love dearly, a spouse, a parent, a child, your best friend, has died recently. 
Maybe you've just retired and you don't know what comes next. Maybe you're about to graduate from college and you don't know whether to go to grad school or get a job or take a year and travel, the, travel Europe. Wish I'd done that, but I didn't. Whatever the change is that's happening in your life that's put you into this liminal space, you feel lost. You've lost your footing. What you knew no longer exists, and you're looking towards something that you don't know. You don't know what to do next. You can't visualize the future. I think our natural tendency as human beings is to do exactly what these disciples did. Stand still with our faces downcast, the scripture said. Stand still with our faces downcast. But what does that accomplish? All that does is close us off from the solutions. All that does is, is put up barriers between us and the people who love us and can help us through it. It narrows our perspective rather than broadening our perspective. Our life becomes smaller and smaller as we become more entrapped in this liminal space without being able to see the future. And as our life becomes smaller, our prospects become smaller. We look ourselves, we lock ourselves into a self imposed prison. But mostly what being forlorn and dejected in these liminal spaces does is it closes us off from Jesus. And he's the real solution to all of these problems, to all of these liminal spaces. He is the way out from every liminal space we find ourselves in. These disciples, by focusing on the negative, Jesus' death, rather than trusting what Jesus had taught them about his resurrection after that death, the positive result of his death, were in this place of despair. Thankfully, Jesus was there to draw them out. When we are in a liminal space, we have the same choices that these disciples did. Now they could have stayed in Jerusalem and continued to do the work of Jesus. Jesus had told his disciples, you wait here, I'm going to tell you when it's time, and then we'll get going on building this new church. <clears throat> you and the Holy Spirit. But they had decided not to do that. Jesus had failed them. So we have these same two choices. We can trust what we have read in the scriptures and know that Jesus is there with us and has a plan for us, or we can allow ourselves to feel abandoned and lost as these disciples did. Jesus said, your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. If we believe that, then there is no reason to despair, or to be downcast, or to walk forlornly on your own personal road to Emmaus. We don't know where these two disciples were going exactly, but we do know that they had turned their backs on Jerusalem, were walking away from Jerusalem, and we're walking away from Jesus. We know that they were walking away from the purpose and the future that Jesus had laid out for them in his discussions with the disciples before his death. Instead of being distraught over his death, they should have been confident of his teaching about the resurrection that he had promised and eagerly awaiting what came next in, his, in their service to him. And so should we, in these difficult in-between times, where we're between something we knew 
and something we can't yet imagine, can't yet visualize, we need to focus on what we know. And what we know is the promise of Jesus. That doesn't mean that we'll have as quick a recovery as these two disciples did, because they turned right around from Emmaus, went right back to Jerusalem. And they went in and they sat down with the other disciples and said, we saw Jesus on the road to Emmaus. He's alive. Finally, they got it. But even if it takes us more time than that, God made provision for it. Jesus said in Matthew, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sometimes when we're in a liminal space, that's God giving us an opportunity to rest. To get from the place where we've been to the place where we're going with less trauma, with less fear, with less uncertainty. Certainly when we're in a liminal space, we are heavy laden with troubles and our uncertainties looking to the future. But during our time of rest, Jesus takes that time and he provides us with teachers. He teaches us, sometimes through people, sometimes through scripture, sometimes through directly from, us, from him to us. Just as he taught these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He has a plan for us, each and every one of us. And I've said before, I don't care how old someone is. Our service to Jesus doesn't end till we're dead. And then it probably doesn't end either, but we just do it in a different place. He has a plan for us. And he will prepare us for that plan. And even when we're in these liminal spaces, these in-between places, when we are uncertain about our future, even when we are on our own personal road to Emmaus and feeling downcast, he still has a plan for us. And if we give him the opportunity, if we open our hearts to him, if we open our minds to his teaching, he will make that plan known and he will prepare us for it making us ready for whatever plan and purpose he has for us in the future. So when you're in a liminal space, and I know some of you are, and I know the rest of you probably will be, somewhere down the road, don't become disheartened. Don't become forlorn. Look at it with the eyes of Jesus that this is a new opportunity and Jesus will lead you into it, teach you what you need to know and bring you there because we are all living in his plan. In his plan. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know you have promised us that you would be faithful and always with us. We know sometimes it feels like you're not, like we've lost traction, like we've lost our foundation. But we know even in those times that you are indeed with us. And if we focus on you, concentrate on you, read the scriptures about you, read the words from you, that you will bring us through, that you always have a plan for us. And so we pray, Lord, that for those going through this today and those who will be going through it sometime in the future, that you will help us to do those things. Keep our focus on you. Keep studying the scripture and look excitedly toward the future that we know you are going to bring us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our final song this morning is... Resurrection Power, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm.